Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Evolved Man Masterclass. Today, I am super excited to have a very special guest, Ken Page. Welcome, Ken. So glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Ben. It is, it is my honor and pleasure. So uh, a brief introduction for you, Ken. Uh, you're a uh, LCSW, uh, licensed clinician social worker, um, a renowned psychotherapist, popular psychology today blogger, uh, a Huffington Post blogger, and author of the bestseller, Deeper Dating, How to Drop the Games of Seduction and Discover the Power of Intimacy. Uh, you've got many more accolades and I won't jump into them now, but um, so happy to have you. So glad to be here. All right. So uh, let's, let's talk about your superhero origin story a little bit. Uh, you weren't always a, a master guru psychologist. Um, how, did you, how did you get into the psychology game? Hmm. Um, my story is an interesting one, I think. Um, I grew up, I was born in the mid-50s, and my parents were pretty extraordinary people, um, Holocaust survivors, both of them. Well, wow. My dad was in concentration camp. Um, my mom was a street artist, is a street artist, still doing amazing work. Um, anyway, it was a pretty extraordinary family of survivors. Um, and, but I, I kind of like it didn't, a lot of what I learned from them really helped me, but a lot didn't help me, nor did the culture help me to be able to find love, friendship, intimacy, or much less of anything else. And Many, many years of my early life were a struggle to find the love with friends, with partner that I desired but was unconsciously pushing away. So uh, that's been a great journey. And, and the, um, the heart and soul of what I discovered, which is the basis for, for, for what I teach, is this realization that the parts of ourselves we feel the most timid about revealing we feel right. the most vulnerable about showing are where our magic is. And life is this strange journey of circling around those parts again and again, but thinking they're too whatever, they're too powerful, they're too intense, they're too humble, they're too vulnerable, they're not enough, they're too much. All of these things that we think because these parts of us are our genius and genius can't get domesticated. It doesn't fit in a box. And the journey for so many of us, the wisdom journey, is to circle around these parts of ourselves and then finally land and say, I'm going to embrace this part of me. And when we do, our story changes. And, you know, that was kind of my big story growing up like a very sensitive kid. Right. A sensitive, soft-hearted kid. Um, very fierce, very intense, and very tender all at once, and, um, and gay. A gay kid growing up like in the 60s, like not so easy, with Holocaust survivors who thought that toughness was everything. Right, you gotta protect yourself. You gotta protect yourself, you've gotta fight. And those super tender feelings, they are nothing but a ridiculous indulgence that could get you killed. Nobody's got um, time for that. Nobody's got time for that if you want to live. So, um, and that's the guy's story too, right? That's like, you know, guys don't have time for that deep vulnerability. So for all those reasons, I shot myself in the foot looking for love until I discovered that those parts of me were my soul and that I actually did the best when I honored them. And there is a cascade of things that happen when we don't honor those qualities. Right. A cascade of, that, that ends up turning into masochistic relationships that don't work. That's where that cascade lands, if you're thinking about love. And in any place where we suppress those core gifts, those original authentic parts of us, it's more than suppression. It is a quiet act of violence. And violence begets violence. And what that we create a vacuum where our core self should be. And that vacuum is always going to get filled with pain and crap and insecurity and bad situations. So I, I want to stop you right there for a sec to ask a question. So sure. you, you started with um, us not wanting to share those core things deep down inside us that we're scared about sharing. Are those um, attributes of ourselves? Are those episodes that we feel shame about? Are they 
both. Fabulous question. Yeah, yeah. Um, it may be episodes, but it's not essentially episodes. It's not about things you feel ashamed about sharing. It is about the parts of yourself that you feel timid about sharing and revealing and doing more than revealing, championing, because okay. that's the key. So then the cascade that happens, the cascade of effects when we begin to treasure those parts of ourselves is a cascade of somehow finding available people, somehow building a life that's more full of love, and building a life with a hell of a lot less friction and a hell of a lot more joy. Um, and some kind of very intimate sense of romance with our own kind of internal nature. Now, the thing about this is that big pieces of ourselves as men, we are told, core gift places, essential places, we are told will make us look less attractive, will make us less worthy, and will not enable us to be men. Right. And it is, and you know, women have this too. Women are told again and again, like, women, leave your balls at the office. Like, <laughs> if you want an alpha male, you have got to like not be too tough you need to get in touch with your femininity so you don't scare a guy off it's like it's like this paradigm shift about gender got halfway and then got stalled and okay. it's stalled for guys in a really bad way and that is kind of epitomized in this alpha male myth um and the alpha male myth says yeah, you can be sensitive and you can be vulnerable but you still have to be an alpha male if you want women or men to be attracted to you if you want to be successful if you want to be a successful guy and guys are shooting themselves in the foot every minute of every day because of this message bottom line is this if you choose a goal of being an alpha male over a goal of just being you right you're fucked <laughs> and it takes us a long time to discover that so let's um, let's take a a step and, and ask the question: What do guys think an alpha male is? How do they define it? Uh, that's separate from their their core self. Uh, good question. Okay, so so you know the concept of the alpha male is um, is a concept that comes from kind of like a, a natural history that right. you know in a group of animals there's going to be an alpha animal, an alpha male and 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 that animal is the leader that animal embodies instrumentality leadership uh confidence force all of those different things and the alpha male model for guys is this you got to be in touch with your heart you got to be in touch with your soul but you still got to be the alpha man and that wraps us into really uncomfortable places. And I just want to give you a bunch of examples of where that might be true. Okay. But I guess, I guess first I just want to say that as a psychotherapist, as um, a teacher and a group leader, I have heard so many times men coming to me um, who, who learn this alpha male paradigm as the key to find love and pick up women, and not just pick up women, but find find love with the woman, and um, found that it was ultimately temporarily effective and essentially hollow. Right. Um, you know, and so many men have said to me, I remember one guy saying to me, Ken, you know, I just have to accept the fact that a, a straight guy, that most women are not going to really want me like they'll want an alpha man because I am not an alpha male. And I looked at this guy and he was so decent and awesome. And I knew that he had so much of what women want, but he did not know that because of this alpha male concept which shoots us in the foot. So I'm going to give you some examples of like where guys get stuck on this. Okay. Okay. So let's say you're feeling longing for someone, not just turn on, but actual longing. Right. That's not supposed to be very alpha male. So what do you do there? You swallow it, you bury it, you say not alpha male enough. That's not the thing to do. Your longing taps the deepest roots of your being. Your longing, when you can own it and claim it, makes you so beautiful to the right person. Here's another example. 
in sex. Let's say a guy feels like he wants to uh, kind of play more of a passive role. He wants his partner on top. He wants to be told what to do. Um, uh, or, or there's a submissive quality that he's interested in exploring, not right. alpha. So screw that. Um, maybe he wants to rest his head on his partner's shoulder and kind of nuzzle into them or cuddle up into them. And he feels like, you know, we have these electrified tripwires of gender taboo that say to us, don't do that, don't do that. You'll be in really big trouble and you will certainly not be attractive if you do that. So that's another example. Um, so quick, so quick I, question on the, on the first example. When we talk yeah. about the guy who has a, a deep longing, right? Um, that if he, if he honors that sometimes, uh, you know, I've, I've talked with a couple other relationship experts. There's also the guy that doesn't want to be like the nice guy or get put in the friend zone by kind of being too available. Right. Right. So it must be a, a fine line to walk then. Well, I would say that that is a load of crap. Okay. Um, to every guy who's worried about that, do not worry about that. You will only shoot yourself in the foot. Now, don't worry about being, it's a great thing to be a nice guy. Don't worry about that for a minute. And let me tell you, if you're a nice guy, you do not want the women who are going to put you in a friend zone because you're too nice a guy. They're not the women for you. All right. So you're saying, in other words, they're trouble. <laughs> for you, right. Okay. They're trouble for you. They are not going to work. You do not want that person. Um, but that's also a really interesting question, too, because there's another part to it, too. I, I want to acknowledge the validity of that, because remember, the key is not being an alpha male. The key is being authentic. That's right. the key. Unless you want to find someone who doesn't want you for a partner, they want someone else. It's got to be authenticity. That's got to be the key. So... You're, you're, with, you're with a woman, let's say, or with a man who um, you feel you're like a nice guy and you don't want to like just, you don't want to do any of those seduction tricks. And guys, let me tell you, everything you have read about seduction tri tricks, throw them out the window. They will screw you over. You do not need seduction tricks. In fact, you use them and they're going to, they're going to sabotage you. You want to be you. You want to be you. Yeah. So, I, re I remember going out one night after, after reading and, and trying that one night. And while some of them did work, I definitely did not feel authentic and did not feel aligned and did not want to continue that. Um, so I, I guess I can attest to that. Well, three cheers for you, right? Because you figured it out up front. It took me decades to learn to stop doing that stuff. So, you know, that was, you were wise and <laughs> self-loving enough to know that you weren't going to go down that route. But for so many of us, it's the only route we're shown. So, you know, uh, we, we go down it. But I just want to stay with this for a minute because, so you're this nice guy, you're attracted to someone, you're interested in them. And, um, you're worried that that's going to put you in the friend zone. That is not what's going to put you in the friend zone. But I also want to say that I would encourage you to honor your romantic self and your eros. So that, for example, you're with someone and you're having like that first cup of coffee or that second date. Right. Um, and you just want to rest your hand on her hand. Or you just want to say something kind of romantic. Let yourself do that. Or you want to tell him that you like him. Let yourself do that. In other words, like, like often guys who are kind of soft-hearted guys don't want to impose themselves on, on the person that they're interested in. Right. So they don't show their eros. They don't show their romance. You have every right to show that in a respectful and enthusiastic way. And in fact, the research shows that... Um, Playing hard to get, although it might make someone temporarily more interested in you, actually makes them like you less. Um, and the research shows that actually showing someone that you like them, not from a place of neediness of like, um, oh God, I'll be nothing without you, but from a place of kind of like 
I've been around the block. I know what I'm looking for. And you are that kind of person. There's almost no greater aphrodisiac. And these are the lessons that we're not taught. So what I would say, guys, is on dates, in bed, everywhere, honor your authenticity. I promise you there's magic there. And I want to tell you another thing, too. If you keep finding that when you do that, the people you're interested in are not interested in you, there's a whole paradigm there. That basically means that you're not honoring who you are. And okay. if you begin to honor those parts of yourself, whether they're alpha typical or alpha atypical or anti-alpha, when you start treasuring and honoring those parts and you make this ground level decision that you're only, only gonna look for partners that love that about you, your entire search for love will change. That's a promise. You will start meeting people who are kinder and more available and who are capable, more capable of love. This is what we're not taught. We're taught to work so much on our attractiveness. We are not taught to work on our attractions. And that's where the deeper, richer work really lies. So I, I think that, that leads to the question, I think I understand you in theory, but how does that, how does one develop their authenticity? I mean, I know for me, it, you know, one of the things I've been working through is, is breaking down my ego wall a bit and trying to get more in touch with my intuition, realizing that I've got this, you know, constructed version of myself, but I need to deconstruct it to kind of, um, uh, un, you know, be an archaeologist and figure out actually what is my authentic self and what does light me up? How, how do you work with people to, to do that? Because I think for guys, like they, they build this man box and it's tough to figure out what authentic means at some point. Wow, that was great. Yes, exactly. And I feel like you just gave really nice quick instructions and in how to do that in what you said. Um, so I just want to take a minute and think of what I want to add to that. Okay, there is an exercise. You know, in my book, Deeper Dating, what I teach is I teach a staged process to identify your core gifts. Um, but in its simplest form, there are two questions that you can ask yourself to help you find your authenticity. And if you take two days and your phone or a notebook and do this process, you will come out the other end knowing the essence of your authenticity. Okay. So what I would ask you to do uh, is take two days. Don't have them be heavy work days, like 12-hour work days, because it's hard to get in touch with your feelings during, during work time. Um, unless you're like a therapist or a coach or <laughs> musician or something like that. In any case, take two days where you've got the space to feel your feelings and ask yourself, two questions. Notice two different things. One, notice what things fill your heart. Walk through your day and notice what things give you peace, what things give you a feeling of joy, a feeling of enthusiasm, of creativity, of silliness, of ridiculousness, of energy, of courage, all of those kind of qualities of inspiration, whatever they are. Notice them. Don't diminish them. Don't walk past them. Stop when you feel that and say, what was that? What was that that inspired some very real, authentic, and wonderful part of me? Right. And note what it was. Take the extra time to honor it and not just think it's like a pleasurable moment, but think, what is it in this? And is that something, and you'll find that it is, something that kind of continually tends to inspire me? Right. So that's one yeah, I think to to that end, one of the things is, as I've tried to figure out what, what lights me up, I've found that, you know, actually doing interviews like this one, I find afterwards, you know, leave me energized. And I'm like, wow, that was a great conversation. And the fact that I get to share that with other people kind of lights me up a little bit. So I think uh, it's, it's a great practice to to get in touch with that. Yeah. So you've just described two kind of core gift places in yourself. You described a part of you that's deeply fed by inspiring conversation and a part of you that's deeply fed by wanting to give, by giving and sharing. Those are pieces of your soul. So 
you would be happy with a person who treasures those and not happy with the person who doesn't. So part two of this exercise is also really, in oh, I want to say one thing more about those moments, those inspiring moments, moments that fill your heart. They're more than moments. They're portals. They're portals to something vast. They're portals to the roots, to the branches, to the trunk of your greatness. They're more than moments, they're portals. And the deeper you sink into them, the deeper you treasure them, the more you live them, the more you embrace them, the more you look for them and play with them, the more immensely happy as a human being you'll be because they're portals. So now, speaking about the second part of this process, here's okay. what it is. Don't just notice those inspiring moments. I want you as well. This is like harder for guys. Um, but I want you to notice the things that hurt your heart, the things that make you feel sad, the things that make you lose energy, the things that make you want to retreat, the things that make you want to curl up, the things that make you not want to try or not want to trust, um, or just hurt. Notice those. The tendency is to tell yourself that you're being too sensitive and that you need to get over it. Right. In these two days, you are not going to do that. You're going to instead think there is a core gift here because we get the most hurt around the things we care the most about. Okay. And the things we care the most about are the closest to our souls, to our true natures. So when you start watching the things that hurt you, you might find that there are moments of inauthenticity, moments of cruelty, moments where you feel like you're not seen, moments where you feel like you didn't see someone else. There'll be a whole range of things. And with each of them, take a moment or two, note what they are, honor them. Write down a note about what caused you pain. At the end of these two days, look at all the things that caused you pain. And I don't mean just big, huge pain. I mean micro pain too, those moments, you know. Um, note all of them and ask yourself, are there central themes? Are there <laughs> themes that emerge again and again? And there will be. And then what you do, it's almost like a connect the dots puzzle. You just connect the dots and a picture will emerge. And a picture will emerge about... Um, your compassion, about a place of deep compassion and connection. That's what you'll find in the hurt places. In the joy places, you will find, you know, the pieces of your soul that light up, the, um, the pieces of you that are adventurous and bold and filled and filling. And um, you'll notice themes there of what do that to you. When you know those two things, then you ask yourself another question. And it's a big big question. And here's the question. Am I really honoring and cherishing these attributes of me? And when you make a decision to make that get a yes answer and to do all the work necessary, your, wor your world will change in the most profound ways and you will find more love and you will find more meaning. It's the stuff that we walk over and walk past because we think it's too much or too little or too sensitive or too intense that is the key, the key to our mission in life and in love. All right. That's a, uh, it's pretty profound right there. I'm just sitting with that and thinking, well, I mean, that's, I think pretty much the, the definition of, of an evolved man, one that, that mm. can, can do that. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with you that that is uh, you know, part of that, that deep soul work that will unlock our, our, our potential in the world. Um, I want to circle back to the activities that hurt our feelings and stuff and wondering if we can put some examples there because that seems a little bit harder for me to um, wrap my head around rather than the, the, the joy part. Oh, sure. Okay. So um, some examples of that would be when you see things in the world, on the news, on the subway, in the street, that feel like people or animals being hurt, okay. being not seen, not being cherished. Those are some real examples. 
another set of examples, and, and, and uh, everyone here can think about that. You've seen... So, things. I mean, if, if I get mad by the current politics or I get frustrated by, um, you know, let's just say, for example, our, our current president not, not honoring women the right way, right? Um, yes. So, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't that make everybody angry or most people angry? And then how does that give me a, a portal into my soul? Yeah, well, kind of, I guess, not... 40% of America, sadly enough. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the rest of us, yes, very much so. And even that 40% underneath um, in many cases. But like stuff that they would never allow in their families or never want their children to do, but because of their politics, they you know um, accept it in our president. Um, But even though they're global things, it doesn't change the fact that they make you who you are. The fact okay. that those things hurt you when you see women treated that way, even though that's kind of, because these core gifts, they're not like so unique that no one else has anything like them. They're like fingerprints. We've all got pretty similar ones, but they all have like kind of a different twist to them. So yeah, when you read about animals becoming extinct, when you read about what's being done to the earth, when you read about immigrant families and it hurts your heart, right. that's your heart, that's your heart, that's compassion. So that's just one example. Again, these parts of yourself, just because a lot of other people feel them, don't mean they're not your soul. They are. Okay. Well, I guess to, to that point, what comes to my mind is, um, you know, my, my wife and I are, are both plant-based in our diet, and, and I identify with, um, you know, the, the, the not harming of, of animals. So I, I guess that could be something where I, I do feel like I'm honoring what, what I saw as that pain and then moving into alignment with that. Exactly. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, another set of examples. So that's like, you know, that's kind of the piece of seeing pain inflicted upon other beings. Um, and, and based on who you are, someone else might not feel pain hearing a certain conversation, but maybe you do. Right. Because it reminds you of a way that you were denied. Or it, you can notice that a person's, let's say, creativity or sensitivity is somehow being neglected or ignored. You might pick up on things that no one else picks up on. And those are attributes of yours. Another set of places you might feel pain is when you look at ways that you have hurt or avoided or neglected or missed the people you love. That's another example. Or, or even strangers, you know. Um, Ways that you feel that you have caused pain or harm or um, by your own stuckness, your own blockness, your own emotions. Those are holy places. Remorse, that kind of authentic remorse changes us more than almost anything else. It's a magical thing. God, it hurts. But, you know, a wonderful quote I heard was, the truth will set you free, but first it'll make you miserable. <laughs> and um, a lot of these feelings that we're talking about now are like that. So that would be another dimension is ways that you might have inflicted pain on other people. And then the final one would be ways in which people inflict pain on you. Maybe subtle interactions with people that you care about or you're interacting with who make you feel controlled or not seen for who you are or not valued, and it could be subtle stuff, and usually we walk over it. But for this exercise, I want you to honor it, because here's my guess. The things that you don't like people doing to you are things that you mostly try not to do to other people too. And that makes, that, those, are, those are marks of unique gifts, because those, for, for each of us, those are kind of somewhat different things. So does that answer the question about um, ways to tap into the places that hurt your heart? Uh, yeah, no, that definitely illustrates it more. Thank you. Good, good, good. And here's what I want to say to every man listening to this. This is a really cool exercise in gender identity liberation. It's a really cool exercise. Every point that you hit with your moments of joy and your moments of pain Notice when what you experienced seems to be in conceptual conflict with what it means to be an alpha male. Notice that. There will be a number of them, guys. And then at those moments, the more you can choose authenticity over 
um, this role. And the more you only look for people who value those parts of you, the more you'll have the life you dream of having. All right. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't necessarily view having in-depth conversations and interviews about how to better ourselves as necessarily alpha. Um, however, I do view it as an, an important part of uh, leadership at the same time. Yeah, I know you do, which I really appreciate. I also really appreciate me being able to come to you and say, you know, make this one that LGBT people are included in and you being so willing to do that. So um, kudos to you for that. It's my, my pleasure. It's, it's, it's part of our evolution. <laughs> yes. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you think is important when we think about this concept of, of the evolved man? I mean, I think it's great to, um, you know, look at those questions about being authentic, but uh, is there anything else that we can do to uh, help ourselves evolve? Yeah. Yeah. I want to teach everyone here in really super brief form. Um, the, the, the personal transformation process that I love the most, love okay. the most. And I meditate and that's, you know, nothing can take the place of that. And, um, but this is an exercise I do every day. And it's one that I teach in all my classes, essentially in all of my groups. And here's what it is. And I'm actually going to lead you guys in it right now. It's just going to take a few moments. Okay. Um, so I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to picture kind of the real authentic you, the you behind all of the glass ceilings, on the other side of all the glass ceilings, the you that's kind of the you that in your heart you feel like you're meant to be, that you, the kind of you that you're born to be and you desire to be, the you that is calling you in this summit. And I just want you to picture that you. What does his face look like? What does it feel like to be in his skin? This like older brother version of you. This evolved guru self of yours. Just picture what that's like to be in his skin. You don't have to feel like you earn it. Just imagine. And now I want you to just kind of like method acting. Just jump in. And just imagine you are behind his eyes. You are in him just for a moment and how that feels. Be that guy. And look at yourself right now today and think of what message you most want to say to the you of today from this more evolved self. Just take a minute and in your head see what comes up. Okay. Good, good. So now I want you to shift back and become you. And keep your eyes closed for a moment. And I want to tell you that this is a part of you that is like your most fabulous, amazing mentor. And you can meet with him every day. You can meet with him every hour. And I promise you, he is going to give you gold for your own life path. Okay, and slowly open your eyes. All right, feel fired up now. I could oh, good. Feel the, the energy shift in, in going there. Would you say what the message is? You don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, it said, uh, don't wait. Don't wait, that's great. So, you know, all of those books of daily meditations, they're all really nice. Make this, do this every day and make it into your daily meditation and watch what happens to your world. I do this every day and it's, um, it creates characterological transformation and characterological stuff is the hardwired stuff, some of which is good and some of which is not good. This process done every day will characterologically shift you and that's like a hard work miracle. But I know a few things that do it better than this tiny and wonderful practice. All right. Well, appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, as we, as we wrap up, do you uh, have a, a, a gift for our audience today? I do. I do. Um, 
This is a gift of an ebook, which is called uh, Four Insights to Transform Your Search for Love. But it applies as well to guys who are in relationships. And it's four insights that really kind of um, completely change the frame of understanding authentic intimacy and help you take the steps toward that. All right. We'll have that, uh, that link with, uh, with the notes of this episode. Uh, Beautiful. I want to thank you very much, Ken, for, for all the wisdom you've shared with us today, uh, as well as that exercise. It's been uh, enlightening. I'm so glad. Thanks, Ben.